What is up, everybody? This is Chris with Fear No Evil Ministries. We are here today to discuss Malcolm Gladwell's TED Talk, The Unheard Story of David and Goliath. Follow the link below, listen, and come back and we will discuss. Welcome back, everybody. I am now joined by the director of Fear No Evil Ministries, John Hughes. Hey, what's up, Chris? Thanks for being here, man. You got it, buddy. So, let's jump right in. Let's do um, it. I just want to say, like, just a side note for me. Uh, this is going to be eye-opening for me, as I assume it is for everybody else listening. I had a very basic knowledge of the story of David and Goliath. Man, you know what? That is uh, a big part of why one of the first projects we're going to be doing as a uh, ministry is we're actually going to be publishing a uh, study guide comic book about the David and Goliath story because it's a hugely misrepresented story that is vitally important uh, to people, uh, especially young men, on uh, on. Um, how to live your life, really, and how to uh, how to be a, uh, a you know a man, um, and that's uh, that's really important, and that's why I think uh, it's it's important for us to have discussions like this because we need to preserve the true narrative, uh, not distorted versions of it. So yeah, I'm really happy to be discussing it today. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm I'm I'm, I'm really excited to just jump right in because uh, I'm also the first to admit I don't know a lot about Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so maybe well, you can enlighten me a little bit. You know, and that's uh, that's an important thing to bring up right now is this isn't going to be just a pure David and Goliath discussion. This is going to be a discussion on what Malcolm Gladwell is is putting out there about David and Goliath. Later, we might do a more comprehensive David and Goliath talk, uh, but for now, we're going to focus a lot on um, on the actual you know TED talk that everybody just went and watched. Yeah. So with that being said, why do you think that he decided to have this TED talk <coughs> in the first place? Uh, short, short answer to that is he's trying to sell a book. Um, you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a very popular, um, book that, um, that he then was promoting, um, with this Ted talk and the book is called David and Goliath underdogs, misfits, and the art of battling giants. So, um, simplest answer is he's trying to sell a book. Now the, the more philosophical kind of abstract answer to that is um, Malcolm Gladwell is a philosopher, and philosophers tend to want to promote um, their own ideas in order to, um, you know, feel more um, in tune with with the public. And I, I think that's a lot. As we kind of dive into who he is and, and why he gives this talk and what his motivations are, I think it's going to become more apparent. Does it? I mean, for me, it's almost like. <coughs> I'm the first to also the first to admit. I'm gonna say that a lot because this is all new for me. But um, uh, philosophers, I feel like sometimes they're they're trying to create a voice for you and give you something to think about. I mean, essentially, right? Um, yeah, I think that honestly, um, I think the more kind of weird but kind of true way of saying that is, I think a lot of times a philosopher is just trying to get you to think like they think. And now that doesn't mean that they're bad people, and that doesn't mean that they are villains or anything. Because the, the important thing to remember about that is that philosopher believes that what they're thinking is helpful. That philosopher believes that if you get on board with what they're saying, it's going to benefit you. So it's not that these people are bad people or anything. And sometimes their philosophies can be helpful to other people, um, but uh, not always. And, and you've got to, be, you've got to be careful about how you present your ideas, especially when you are presenting them within the framework of a historical narrative um, which is where I think Gladwell runs into some trouble here is that he's uh, he's diving into a historical narrative that I, I think he has a, a lot of uh, a lot of wrong ideas about. Yeah. So with that being said, does the actual David and Goliath battle, uh, based on what you the listeners heard and what we've heard, does that really fit the framework of his concept? Do you think? Um, See, that's, uh, that's a, a very direct way of, of going into this discussion because I don't think that it does. Uh, when Gladwell wrote this book, he was writing this book to try basically to kind of turn the, um, the public idea of an underdog on its side. Like he was, he was trying to say um, that there is a reason why um, the underdog triumphs and it might be that that perceived underdog is not really an underdog after all. And um, so what's ironic is we'll, you know, and I might 
explore this more, and, and again, in a, in a talk that's more focused on David and Goliath and not just on Gladwell's impression of David and Goliath. But um, the, it is true that in this fight, David was not an underdog. That is absolutely true. But the, the thing that gets lost in the philosophical view of um, Gladwell's impression is that David was not truly the opponent of Goliath in the biblical framework of this story is that God was. Um, God was the opponent of the Philistines in this, truly in the narrative, and God is undefeated. Uh, God is never going to be an underdog. Nobody ever says, yeah, God against who? Um, yeah, we'll, we'll take, uh, we'll take, we'll take God because we want to win some, some dough on that bet. Like you're never gonna, you're never gonna, um, you know, cite God as an underdog. So if, if God is the opponent, God wins. And so, yeah, you can make a case that there is no way that you could call David a, uh, an underdog in this story, but for absolutely none of the reasons that, uh, that Gladwell proposes. Uh, Gladwell is going to try to paint the picture of David as this, you know, oh man, he, he's like, um, he's a warrior. You know, David is, uh, is in Gladwell's eyes, David is a movie hero, you know, uh, the kind of guy that, like James Bond, you know, like that's how, uh, that's how Gladwell is going to try to paint David. And the truth is, Without God on his side, David loses this fight every time, and and so that's what we need to get back to. But uh, but that's not what Gladwell you know uh, proposes. So that's not exactly what we're going to be discussing. We're going to discuss more of what Gladwell has to say about it. Okay, right on, man. Um, the thing about that is, do you really feel like Gladwell hits anything on the head, gets anything right about the narrative at all? <clears throat> well. That's where I think we're gonna we're gonna start getting into a uh, um, a point by point on uh, on what everybody just heard when they listened to Gladwell's talk. Hopefully they did. It'd be weird to listen to this if you didn't. Um, but um, the uh, uh, that's where we start getting into some direct um, references on this. And uh, the the simple answer to that question is is really no. Um, but we'll uh, you know we'll start with where Gladwell starts. And Gladwell starts by explaining. Um, the the battle, but he first introduces his own talk, and when he introduces his own talk, he kind of shows his cards. Um, and what he says is, he says, "What upsets me is that I heard this story, thought I understood it, and then later went back and looked again and realized I didn't understand it at all." And what's interesting about that and, and what you need to understand about when somebody says that is when when Gladwell says that to us he doesn't give us a source he doesn't say I then studied some materials or I was then taught by an instructor or I was then helped with this he cites that originally he had a misunderstanding and then later now he suddenly understands it and gives us no reference as to why he now suddenly understands He's suddenly it. enlightened yeah, he just receives some enlightenment out of out of nowhere, and we're not given much. Now he might explain that more in the book, or you know something. But uh, if you're going to give this talk, I understand you're trying to keep it short and buckle up. Ours is going to be much longer than his was. Um, but uh, he's he's trying to keep it short. But you've got to explain to people why there has been a change, like why you now go back and see it differently. There has to be some study done. There has to be some foundation as as to what you're trying to say and. What he's trying to do there is he's, you know, he's basically by titling this talk, The Unheard Story, is he is asserting himself as an authority on something strictly out of his own created understanding of it, which is strange. Yeah, you can't write a, you can't write a high school or college paper like that. Exactly. And that is what <laughs> a high school student would understand about this that two and a half million people don't. You know, who have listened to this talk and who enjoyed it and who didn't think anything of where his information was coming from. That's not to take anything. I'm sorry. That's not to take anything away from. I'm just, you know, in my mind, this is, I couldn't have put anything out like this and not have some sort of reference to. Yeah, yeah. and you know, and the thing is, this is a, you know, um, this is I'll ironically say an outlier for you know uh, for Gladwell uh, when he writes his books, he does a lot of research, he takes a lot of time uh, to do these things, but. Um, in this talk, 
his summary is is far too general and it doesn't give you enough to really um, to really draw you into why he is an authority. He gives no reason why he's authority except for his own assumption. And I don't think that you can make assumptions to become an authority. I think you have to study. And when we listen to his talk, he sounds like he's studied a little bit, but when you go back and you fact check and you, you cross reference the things he tells you, you find out that it's likely most of this is built on assumption. So, um, he starts after introducing his talk. Uh, he starts with David. Um, he introduces David as uh, first off. He he refers to him multiple times as a little boy, um, which we actually know is not true. Uh, David was um, a, a young man. Now he wasn't you know old. I mean he wasn't a fully you know mature man, but he was old enough that they at least let him go into the fight. Um, a little boy, like we see in the cartoons, like you referenced when you were, that you saw when you were younger, a little boy goes up to the king and says, I'll fight this giant. He's going to get laughed out of the building. Um, but um, that's not what happened. David was allowed to go out and, and fight this battle because he was at least minimally capable of doing it. So, um, you know, then um, when after, you know, he's referred to as by Gladwell as a little boy, Gladwell then starts trumping him up a little bit to, uh, to for, you know, to, to get more in line with his perspective on this, which is that David was the favorite in the fight. Um, and the first thing he, he cites in that is David's choice of weapon. So uh, David's sling is referred to uh, several times by Gladwell as a devastating weapon. And uh, Gladwell will go so far as to explain that in um, ancient warfare, that these armies had infantry, that, um, you know, uh, or artillery that used long range weapons. And he goes on to explain that these slingers could uh, hit targets with accuracy at 200 yards. And he, he paints this picture of an Israeli army that, um, that is very different than the one that we're given in the Bible. But the Bible famously gives us uh, important details uh, without um, overdoing it, but also make sure that we always understand what's going on in the situation. If David is such an expert at this sling weapon, and if this Israeli army has an artillery unit full of uh, expert slingers that could use this weapon to a devastating degree, uh, why are they afraid of the Philistines? Why are they standing on the side, not wanting to go into the valley? Why are they um, 40 days, 40 nights, watching Goliath come out and taunt them over and over and over again? Um, that was not a part of this army. Yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm not a historical expert, but you, you would think if they had that kind of artillery, you, it's long range. You could just pick off who you need to pick off. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what we would expect. Um, if the uh, if the if either army in this fight um, had long range capability, they would not have resulted to uh, champion warfare uh, or what he calls single combat. It would have been the fight would have been over. So David is the only one that has this weapon, and it's because this weapon wasn't generally used in this situation. Did the sling exist as a weapon? Yes, but as a deterrent to animals uh, for shepherds, it did not exist as a military weapon at this point. There is no historical uh, reference for that. There is no reason to believe that. The story would have been very different if we had an entire army of, of slingers at this point. Not to mention, like you said, like he said in the video, uh, 200 yards. So I mean, we think of a football field. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, when he says that a... Uh, that a slinger could accurately pick off the target at 200 yards. Um, that gives us a really weird uh, uh, yeah, point of reference that, that I don't think is very helpful. Uh, for example, like uh, this is, is kind of a funny story. I was with a friend at a gym once and earlier in the day we were, it was close to when the NFL draft was going to be happening. And we were watching these videos of this one quarterback, uh, and I don't remember who it was at this point, but this one quarterback was trying to enhance his draft stock 
by posting all these crazy videos of all these throws he was making that were showing what an accurate quarterback he was. And I remember one of them was that he threw a football, uh, threw a basketball hoop from across the court. And when we were at the gym, uh, we were just shooting baskets, playing around. And sure enough, sitting over there on the floor under one of the goals was a football. And so I was like, hey, man, you think I could do it? My friend's like, I don't know. Give it a shot. I picked up the football, threw it across, banked it in off of the backboard, right through the hoop, first try. Now, if I can do that, and I did it on my first try, that doesn't mean that I can continuously do it over and over again. But the thing is, that's absolutely irrelevant anyway in warfare, because if you are a slinger in this army and you're standing 200 yards away from where there are targets and where there's a battle, you're not actually taking the time to set up aim and, and fire at somebody. You're firing into a crowd hoping to hit something. That's, okay. they'll, they'll poke and hope when you play pool. Yeah, that's that's where um, that's that's what it was back then. There you know there weren't these you know uh, incredibly accurate weapons like sniper rifles. For example, if you are a soldier out in a field uh, and you're firing across at an enemy, you're not lining up your shot perfectly. You don't have time for that. You're firing into a fray and you're hoping to hit something. Mm -hmm. Only a sniper lines up a target from that far off and. These weren't snipers. This is this is not part of this type of ancient warfare. You can't just say, as Gladwell does, you can't just keep referencing ancient warfare and then group it all together into one thing that was the same every time. So um, citing David as having a devastating weapon at this point is absolutely ludicrous. He, he had a shepherd's tool, um, not a weapon, and that's important. He did not have a devastating weapon. He had a sling that he could sling rocks with that with all of his own accord, at best, he could deter animals with it. That was what this was, and it's very important to remember that um, going forward. And so um, the next thing he does is he then turns his attention to Goliath, and um, Gladwell is clearly fascinated by Goliath in this story, and he seeks to discredit Goliath by spending most of the, the, the talk focused on why he believes that Goliath was basically a fraud. And um, so some things that he brings up about Goliath is, I think he starts, uh, if I remember correctly, with uh, the armor bearer, uh, or not, the, I mean the shield bearer. He mentions that um, Goliath is being led onto the uh, the battlefield by uh, what he calls like a, a valet or an escort or something in the. Uh, I think he's a young boy or something. Yeah, he calls him a young young boy for whatever reason. I don't know why he would assume it was like a little kid or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, Goliath being led on by an, oh an attendant, I think he says. Oh, Goliath okay. led on the battlefield by a shield bearer, and um, I don't know why uh, Gladwell has such a problem with that because the thing is, what he keeps forgetting is that in this moment. David is the anomaly. David, it's weird that David is there. David's not the normal situation. Goliath is the normal situation. So what, what Gladwell's doing is he's treating David as if David's the normal situation, and then Goliath is the weird one. What he needs to assume is that anything that's happening with Goliath is the way it's normally supposed to go. Standard operating procedure. Yes, because he's the one with experience. So you need to assume that if the Israelis also send out a champion, they would do it exactly the same way. They were just lacking a champion. So um, it, it's, for example, if you turn on any boxing match or any UFC fight, um, any any one-on-one -on -one battle, you're going to see the fighter uh, led to the arena by people, by trainers, by equipment holders, by you know, managers. There's always going to be something, somebody coming with them. That still holds true today. Why Gladwell thinks it's so strange is uh, beyond me. But he, he cites it as... Um, as Goliath being incapable to even lead himself onto the battlefield, he even brings up uh, how slowly Goliath um, makes it to the uh, to the side of the battle, and why Goliath should run into the battle like, is beyond me. Also, like, so for no other reason than I just found it funny to myself. The first thing that came to mind for me was the uh, Looney Tunes. The uh, I will call him George, and I will hug him and squeeze him. I just for those listening, just. When you get insights, my head, I just thought that was kind of funny. You mean uh, like Goliath has that? 
character. Yeah, as Goliath as the lumbering. Yeah, dark, 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 yeah. Dark. He he clearly sees Goliath as a fool, and that's you know your what the point you're trying to make is going to become more evident as we keep exploring how, who he thinks Goliath is. But um, so he cites Goliath. He he then uh, makes reference to the fact that Goliath is wearing 100 pounds of armor. He also uh, something I should have brought up initially. He cites Goliath as being six foot nine. That is not biblical. Um, he is saying Goliath is six foot nine to make a more believable case for who Goliath is. And that is unfortunate. Um, but he, he's afraid of not being seen as credible. Uh, he wants you to believe what he's saying. So six foot nine sounds a lot better than nine foot six. And he didn't just get it backwards. He's just giving you a more realistic in today's narrative uh, size for Goliath when later he even cites uh, that at one point the tallest person in the world was uh, 8 foot 11. Why it's impossible for him to believe somebody could be 9 foot 6 is beyond me, but if the Bible says that's how tall this person was, then that's how tall the person was. There's no reason to argue that or to rationalize it. It's just part of the story. Um, you can't go pick and choose what you believe to be true when you read a historical account. You just have to accept it or not. And he's bending some things to to be seen as more credible. So, um, but uh, but yeah. So he's um, he's now citing that Goliath is wearing hundred pounds of armor, uh, and he's saying that this is going to give him a disadvantage against uh, David, who's not wearing any armor. And I don't know if anybody else can like rationalize this, but if you're nine foot six and you are a warrior, hundred pounds of armor is really not a big deal. It's really not a big deal um, if if you are that big and that tall and that strong, and you have experience with armor. Um, you know you're also expecting the other guy to be wearing it, so you know it's it's you know um, it's it's not an issue. But um, if he sees David coming at him with no armor, um, he's not going to see himself as being disadvantaged because he feels like he's protected. Yeah, maybe you know David could be faster than him, but. What is David going to do to him while he's wearing all of this armor? And David is is completely vulnerable because he's not wearing any. You know, we, we know that Goliath is holding a javelin. You know, he could throw a javelin at David, and David better be able to, uh, to dodge it because if he can't, it's going right through him. He has no shield, no armor, and so it's not an advantage. It's a concession. You know, you're, you're giving up uh, protection for speed, which is okay, but... Um, I don't know if everybody would do that. Yeah. I don't know if I would do that. Yeah. I would I would probably want a little something, at least a shield to protect me. This isn't the Matrix. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'll be fine. All I gotta do is duck every shot perfectly. No, I don't think anybody thinks that. No. Um, you know, David doesn't go into the fight seeking an advantage. David goes into the fight only uh, of his own accord because he believes God will protect him. He's not trying to get a speed advantage or tactical advantage or anything like that. He is confident that the fight is already won, and that's something that Gladwell is not prepared for. And just, you know, and I don't know if this is a point you're going to make it so, you know, later on in our talk here, but uh, to me, all these things, the the, uh, the rationalizing of the size of Goliath, the idea that uh, David was the anomaly and, or, and, and things like this, it's... To me, it just feels like there's a distinct lack of the faith part of the thing, of, of God. There's a, it feels like we're taking that out. or that, and there, Not that his, that's his intent, but it, just, it, it sounds like that to me from my perspective. Yes, Chris, spoiler alert, you did uh, just deliver the thesis of the entire talk in the middle of the talk. So, oh, I'm sorry. How dare you? That's okay. No, that's okay. It <laughs> okay. Is, it's important, and it's okay for us to say that now and then revisit it, because that is what Gladwell is doing. He's rationalizing this with human understanding. And when you do that to the Bible, you make it a pretty useless book, and uh, and that's that's unfortunate. So, um, well, so I, had, I honestly, I honestly had no idea that. Yeah, was, yeah no. you're totally right. Um, so, uh, but back to uh, you know, so that issue, back to the problems he has with Goliath. So, you know, we've discussed uh, that he's walking slowly to the battlefield, that he's um, he's got an armor uh, or he's got a, a shield bearer. Um, then uh, he says that. It's strange that uh, Goliath doesn't react to David's approach of him. Um, and think about it this way. If you are a UFC fighter and you walk into an arena, because there's no reason not to compare these two because these are warriors. These are people who are supposed to be fighting one-on-one. -on -one. Single combat. If, yeah, if a UFC fighter walks into the octagon and his opponent walks in and they're standing across from each other, um, you know, believing the fight will begin soon, and suddenly 
the one fighter pulls a slingshot out and starts whipping it around, um, the other fighter isn't going to suddenly go into duck and dodge mode um, and trying to run around and not get hit by the slingshot. He's going to stand there dumbfounded. Be confused. Yeah. And he's, questions. <laughs> he's probably going to think that this guy's just putting on a show, that maybe he's just like, look at this, and then I'm going to put it away and then get to the fight. Um, he's expecting this other warrior to do what he expects he is going to do. So it's not that, you know, Goliath is, you know, a fool or, or stupid or anything like that. He's just unprepared for what's going to happen. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with him. It's actually weird that David is doing this. So Goliath isn't unprepared from a standpoint of not being a capable soldier. He's unprepared in the fact that he is a capable warrior who expects a certain decorum to this fight that David's not going to follow. And quite frankly, David is unfair in what he's about to do, but Goliath doesn't understand that because this has never happened before. Uh, the one thing I should probably bring up a few times, you know, over and over again in this talk is this has never happened before. No one has ever done what David is about to do. So there's no precedent for it. So there's no plan for it. So there's no proper reaction for it. Right. Goliath was caught off guard. And he should have been because it's never happened before. Um, so uh, we shouldn't condemn Goliath as a warrior for that. It's totally normal. Everybody would have done the same thing. And the more prepared you are, the more strange it is when things don't go the way that you expect them to. Yeah, when if you're dumbfounded, you don't go into a fight or flight, you know, thing. You're just like, yeah, you're, you're processing. You're yeah. like, well, yeah, absolutely. He probably, you know, looked at. You know, I would expect if I was just imagining, he probably turned around at his guys like, "Is this serious? Yeah, like, is, is this some this, sort of joke? Yeah, is this?" And and that's kind of where he goes to next. And um, next, he goes to the part where he is insulted. And this is another way uh, that Gladwell just has this inherent misunderstanding of just basic human nature. Uh, the next thing we get is that Goliath tells David that he comes to him with sticks. And in the, the TED Talk, um, Goliath, or Goliath, Gladwell has this charismatic moment where he's very dramatic in the way he delivers this and he's like you come to me with sticks and he's trying to he's trying to express that he's about to give you this insane revelation about um about something you never this is going to be devastating when you when you learn this and then he immediately seamlessly transitions uh, transitions into this acromiglia um discussion uh, which is the gigantism and he explains that people who and he cites generally uh that there were medical journals that talked about this. He doesn't give you a specific one. He doesn't actually go into that. Now, maybe he didn't have time for it, but uh, he does. It's a short video. Yeah. yeah. And uh, already shorter than this one that you're listening to right now. Um, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, he, he just goes into this general discussion about uh, how acromeglia can affect your sight. And so he theorizes and then says other people have theorized. Again, doesn't cite who they are. He could have, but he doesn't because he's not lending any actual expertise to this. He's just saying that in general, people have said that Goliath probably had bad vision. So here's where that becomes an irrational point. Um, if he is saying to David, uh, you come to me with sticks, as Gladwell believes, because he's got double vision, um, think about that for a second and think about if he's got double vision and he's seeing two sticks in David's hands, why are we leaving out the part that he would also see two hands? He would see David's hand, whichever one's holding the staff, he would see the hand on each staff if he's seeing double vision. Yeah, you would think so. Uh, the presupposition that, that Gladwell's making here is that Goliath has impaired vision and cannot comprehend that he has impaired vision. He, to this argument, if he's really making this argument, Goliath is this incredibly um, incomprehensible person who walks around thinking everything he sees is more than one thing. Everybody's got multiple hands. Yeah, Goliath is like, that man has two heads. That, that dog has four eyes on its head. This, uh, the, the, the tree, there's two trees right next to each other. Like, Goliath would have to apply that same comprehension to every moment of his life if you're, if you're going to apply that to this moment in this story, and that doesn't make any sense at all. The point where Gladwell tries to make his most charismatic revelation in his argument is probably the most ridiculous part of his entire argument. It does not make sense that 
um, that he would would think that David is holding more than one stick. The more rational explanation of that is that single combat, or you know, um, it it means that the one warrior who comes represents the entire army. You win this battle, you win it for your entire army. So it actually makes sense to Goliath to address David as the plural, because he, when he addresses David, he's addressing the entire army. Yeah, he's representative of the army as a whole. Yeah. So, like, if you are, a, if you have a team with you in a in a, a sport we're about to compete against each other in, and I am talking to you, I'm addressing your whole team. I might say you guys or something like that. I have a feeling if if Goliath casually referred to David and said you guys. Um, Gladwell would then say, oh, he thought David was more than one person. Like, no, he's just, he's just referencing the, the entire army, you know, when he does this. If I'm applying a logic to, like, modern day, um, we, 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 we do take note that this is 40 days, right? That, yeah. So, you know, if I were Goliath, I would assume that they did not come to battle with, uh, the proper... Weaponry, so sticks sticks probably wouldn't cut the mustard. Yeah, well, and to him, David represents all of them, yeah. and so he's you know he's going to you know treat them like that, and and that's that's reasonable. That and that makes absolute sense for um, for Goliath to do at this point. So um, you know, so that's now summarizing his characterization. The characterization of David is is absolutely inaccurate. David was not a member of the army. Um, if, if David was this expert marksman that he's trying to portray him to be, David would have been sent out immediately by the army because this army was not, again, it was not a bunch of fools. The, the fact that they are in ancient times does not make them simple. These people were experts at warfare. These, they're an army. This is not their first battle. This is, there's a reason why they're wise enough to be on the edge of the valley and not going in like there's a reason why they they know what they're doing they uh they are capable they're not fools and um so his characterization of david coming in as this expert marksman that was just not being used by the army is is a little ludicrous uh, if he was known if he was an expert marksman also everybody would know because at this point one thing i will say is the difference between ancient culture and today is that would be a big deal. Everybody would sure. know that about David, and everybody would talk about that because they're not going to be talking about what they saw on TV last night. They're not going to be talking about the baseball game they saw. They just talk about each other. Like the the, were the celebrities of the day were just anybody who could do anything. And David was already known in his, this culture because at this point he had already been part of King Saul's court. He had already been uh, playing music for him. He had already been writing songs. He People knew who David was, and they would know that he was this expert marksman. And then when he walked up and he agreed to challenge Goliath for them, uh, they would have said, oh, you know what? David can actually do this because he's going to use that sling. And he's going to go out there and hit him right between the eyes. So with the, with the point you made about being part of uh, Solomon, right? Uh, the king's, you said the king's court, right? Or king Saul. King yeah. Saul, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. I jumbled that up. But um, maybe going back to the taking the faith out of it, Maybe they, part of them were like, well, he does X, Y, and Z. Maybe some, maybe, maybe some part of them were like, maybe he can. Well, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll address stuff like that more in like an actual, like just pure oh, okay. David and Goliath talk. Um, but one thing I can tell you is not a single person in that army thought David could win. Okay. None of them. None of them did because of the reasons why Gladwell's wrong about all this. Okay. They did not feel like he had the tools. They had no confidence in him at all. And if they had, they would have said so. And again, they would have called him to fight. They wouldn't have, you okay, know, yeah. discouraged him from fighting. You know, okay. they would have said, hey, don't worry about sending him out with armor. He's going to use that sling. That was a misunderstanding on my part. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's prepared only because... He is confident in the Lord. He is not going out of his own volition. And it's just, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense, uh, the, the points that, uh, that Gladwell's trying to make here. Okay, yeah, good point. So I guess ultimately, with everybody having uh, presumably listened to this and watched Gladwell's video and taken in what he said and what you said and what we're discussing here today, 
why do you think he even wrote this book? Um, inherently, as people, um, we want other people to understand us, and we want to feel like there are other people like us, and we also want to be helpful to those people. You know, uh, I'm doing this because I want to help people like me, just the same way that Gladwell did it because he wanted to help people like him. And uh, the the problem here is that Gladwell has uh, has walked into uh, unfamiliar territory, and he's acting as though he's home, and that's not. That's not the case. He, he clearly has a lack of understanding of this story, um, and he's, he's trying to apply it to his own purposes. And uh, in preparation for this, I, I did a lot of uh, research about Malcolm Gladwell, and I watched a lot of interviews that Gladwell gave uh, discussing the concepts behind this book and his motivations. And when you, when you look at um, Gladwell's motivations, his reason for rationalizing this story this way become pretty clear and um the the biggest tell he has is uh, a talk he gave uh, at wharton college where he he literally says um, he's going to give you an insight into his psychology and his direct a uh, direct quote from him is i'm far more stress avoidant than i am joy seeking uh, the fact that the underdog is happy means very little to me next to the distress of the favorite. So that was his explanation of why he is embittered towards the concept of an underdog. He does not like the underdog. He wants the favorite to win every fight. And so he's trying to discredit the entire concept of the underdog altogether. And that's why he wrote this book. It's because it was a topic that was so stressful for him that he wanted to perpetuate his own rationalization of it to make himself feel better, really. You know, and he explains himself as someone who wants people to understand things. And he, he says that uh, in some of his interviews. He's, I want people to understand things. And the, the real truth is what he's really saying is, I want people to understand me. And the thing is, that's okay. It's, it's totally okay to say, I want people to understand me. But um, you've got to be careful with how you present that, um, that concept. You've got to be careful about how you present yourself. You don't present yourself as a philosophy. You present yourself as a person, and you then give your philosophy, and that's okay. But you don't act like you're right. You, know, you don't act like you're right. You don't act like you know the uh, truth about something that you didn't create and and that's what he's trying to do he's a he's a rationalist he's somebody who can really only explain things to the limits of his own understanding he doesn't seem to really pull in a lot of other people's concepts or a lot of um you know uh actual understanding that other people might be able to give him he he looks at a situation and he thinks if this was me how would I understand what's going on here? If I was there, what would I think? And, uh, you know, he clearly, when he inserts himself into the David and Goliath story, he's the smartest guy in the room. He's the only one who, who understands what's really going on. And uh, the unfortunate thing is to know what's really going on, all you have to do is read the actual text. Uh, you just read the actual text and it tells you everything that's going on and that is all that you need. And and that's just not good enough for him. Um, he is somebody who wants to feel like people understand him. And he, he actually, in, in these interviews, he, he even says that he is a Christian, um, which he might be. I don't want to judge anybody on, on their faith. Um, but uh, he says that he, was, he had kind of strayed away from his faith and that writing this book reinvigorated it. And the really interesting thing about that is the concept that you brought up a few minutes ago that I chastised you for. Is <laughs> and my inadvertent he, uh, spoiler. Yeah, he takes God completely out of this story. And so how it strengthened his faith is beyond me. And uh, I, I don't understand because it faith doesn't come into his discussion at any point at all. And... Um, I, I said I didn't want to do like a David and Goliath talk necessarily, um, but I think it's important to say that um, 
when David walks out to the battlefield, um, he does something pretty incredible. And Gladwell never cites this, but uh, I think if he did, it might actually strengthen his own argument in his own eyes, but it really wouldn't. It, it really strengthens the truth. And a lot of people don't actually know this, but um, in Gladwell's talk, he he talks, he, he quotes Goliath saying, I'll, feed, I'll give your your um, your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. He, he quotes what Goliath said, but then he never actually gives you David's response. And David's response cements the truth about this story, which is very important. When Goliath threatens David, David immediately responds with this quote, and this is quoted from the ESV. There, might, there are different translations, but this is what I've got right here. Uh, David says to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. So he's turning Goliath's threat against him. He's quoting what he just said to him. He's saying it back with more conviction. And he says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. So when Gladwell earlier references Goliath's lack of reaction to what David does, he completely skips over the fact that before anything happens, David walks straight up to Goliath and tells him he's about to kill him confidently. This young man, not a boy, this young man walks up to Goliath and says, I am about to kill you. And that's not an underdog. Yeah. So in a way, that would, like I said, strengthen Gladwell's point because sure. his whole point is that David's not the underdog. David is the clear favorite in this fight. But David reveals himself in this moment something that is shattering to Gladwell's interpretation. David says the reason he's going to win is one reason, one reason alone, and it's because of the Lord. David does not say, I am going to defeat you because I'm good with a sling. David doesn't say, I'm going to defeat you because I just figured out by what you said to me that you can't see, or I can tell that you're slow, or your armor is going to slow you down. Or that I won the division and I'm 37 and I know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, David doesn't cite his own brilliance in this. He says, God is going to win this. He's going to give you into our hand, is what he says. And here's what's awesome about that and what, what people like Malcolm Gladwell don't understand. Um, now, I'm going to now do something that I said most people shouldn't do, and I'm going to cite the more simplistic culture from back then uh, that I said is kind of offensive in the way that some people deliver it to strengthen certain arguments. But back then, while these people were just as smart as we are, they were just as sophisticated as we are. They didn't have television. They didn't have, um, you know, uh, some of the things that we have today. And the thing is, it's not that they were incapable of figuring out how to make things like that. They tried enough. They just didn't care. Nobody sat around back then wishing they had a television. People just didn't worry about that kind of stuff. They had their own ways of entertaining themselves and their own things they had to worry about. Because at this point in culture, Every single culture is constantly at war. Like every single culture at this point is trying to establish themselves in a land, trying not to become slaves, trying, like there was no just sitting around and being free back then. Like you had yeah. to either dominate or be dominated. And um, so the biggest thing in the culture at this point is warfare. If you're a man at this point, what do you sit around talking to all your buddies about all the time? Um, war is I was saying. Yeah, yeah, you don't talk about football, didn't exist. No. Uh, you don't talk about television, didn't exist. Um, you, you most of the time, you know, I mean, you might talk about women, you know, you don't, like, talk, you don't talk about Game of Thrones. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you're yeah, kind, of, kind of in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. There's none of that going on <laughs> at this point. Um, so you talk about really a couple of things. You talk about history. Uh, you might talk about, you know, they might sit around talking about, you know, um, Moses and stuff. You know, I, I don't know. Like they, they might sit around talking about, um, you know, stuff like this, but, uh, most of the time, they're going to be talking about, oh, man, I killed a dude in that one battle. It was amazing. Like, you know, that was awesome. Like, they're going to sit around talking about battle. 
And David knows that. David's a part of this culture. He knows that war is vitally important to people and it's culturally significant and it's a big deal. And so he makes it a point to not walk up and surprise Goliath. Like that that's what Gladwell is trying to assume is that David surprises him with, with what he does. Um, he doesn't actually. He walks up, takes a moment to stop and give this monologue like a wrestler at you know in the middle of a ring you know like there's a difference between running in the ring and ambushing somebody walking in and asking for the microphone so he's not sneaking up on anybody he walks up and asks for the mic and says i'm gonna kill you because god is on my side so he says that and he says the reason i'm saying it is so that everyone will know that this battle is the lord's and so everyone on both sides of the of the battle hear what he says. They're tuned in. This is the first time in over a month that somebody has actually walked up and faced Goliath. Every single eye is on this moment right here. Every warrior in the valley is watching. These are all of the most influential men in society at the point. The, the warrior in the army is the most important man in the culture. These are the people that are influential, that people are going to listen to. And David says in front of all of them, I'm going to win because of God. Listen to me. And every single person then watches him take Goliath out in a few moments. And then they are going to go tell everybody. So what's, powerful. what's super awesome about this is what David just did is he became an evangelist. And that's amazing. And we need to understand that David had a purpose in this and that Gladwell's talk takes that purpose entirely out of it. And it takes a story about God and makes it into a story about a person. And that is a tragedy. And we, we shouldn't do that. We, um, we should leave the Bible the Bible. If you want to look back on history and you want to, um, you know, um, be philosophical about history and you want to, um, you know, you want to make assumptions about what might have been in, in certain battles. And, and there are so many interesting stories that you could go back and you could deconstruct and you could add your own assumptions to and that you could, you could make theories about and you could discuss in a healthy way. But when you take God out of this story, this story becomes completely meaningless. And this story will lead all of you to your own destruction because Goliath was not a phony champion the way that uh, Gladwell uh, believes he is. Goliath was a dangerous uh, man who was well-known, who was chosen by the army um, very carefully to represent them and had been intimidating an entire other army of capable men. These were not dunces standing on the sideline uh, afraid for no reason. These were men who were seeing this guy trotted out here every day for 40 days. They had a good look at him. They knew who he was. They were not fools. They were right to not go out and get killed. Uh, David won this fight because of God, period. There is nothing else. So that's, um, that's where we, that's where we stand. And, and this isn't a new concept. This is what, this is the way people have been truly explaining this story for, you know, um, for all the time since the, since the story was first written down. This is how we explain it with, with the story itself. There's, there's no reason to go back and try to rationalize it and, um, and re-explain it. There's no unheard story of David and Goliath. The, the title of his talk is ironic because there, there is no unheard story. It, we heard it, and it's awesome. Yeah, there's still, you don't rationalize. Like, let's say, for instance, uh, Babe Ruth goes out and calls a shot, right? And if, if you believe in that, then... Everybody that was at that game saw it, and it happened. And then they went and told their buddies, because not everybody was at that game, and word got around, and everybody believes it. It has gone down now as a common nomenclature that happened. So yeah. what, is it that far off to believe that this can't be possible? Well, yeah, um, and, and that's a, you know, that, like that we could get into a whole you know, other discussion uh, with a point like that, because uh, the thing is you, you can't, uh, the Bible is you're either with it or against it. You either believe every word of it or you believe none of it uh, because it's it doesn't make sense not to. And you know, and again, that's a bigger talk that we could you know have in another time. But 
Um, I wonder how Gladwell would feel if uh, if somebody took the book that he wrote and say, you know, hey man, I uh, I, I liked your book and I liked all the concepts in it, and I, I put a talk together re-explaining your your viewpoints so that people would understand it better. I think Gladwell would be confused by that, and uh, and that uh, Christians are, are confused at how he portrays the Bible, and, and I think that's fair. So, oh, yeah. you know. Well, man, that was enlightening, man. I really, I, I had a very simplistic view of David and Goliath based on how I was raised. And this really does uh, put in perspective, you know, that it's easy to, uh, for me, it's easy to misconstrue a story if we don't take in all oh, the facts. Yeah, and you know what? I mean, uh, I don't want to do too much like behind the scenes stuff or anything, but when, when you and I sat down and we first started watching the video so we could prepare for this talk, you know, uh, remember that um, only a few moments into the video, he said something that sounded very scholarly, and your response to it was, wow, I didn't know that. And uh, my response basically back to you was, hey, you still don't, you still don't know that, because it's just a guy said something. You know, yeah. It's just a guy said something. Uh, whenever you hear talks like this, you have got to uh, understand that that's not the end of it. You've got to go do research, you've got to go ask questions, you've got to learn. Um, don't take one person's word for it. Don't even take my word for it. Go study this. You know, go on to uh, Bible Gateway and, and look up commentary on the David and Goliath narrative and and see what everybody's thought about it from the beginning. And then do more research. Don't just let me contradict Malcolm Gladwell and then that be the end of it. Uh, you know, go and find out more about this that that is out there. There's all kinds of commentaries out there. There's books written about this from a, a true biblical standpoint. And, uh, and just, you know, the, the thing I want you to do is, is keep the Bible in the Bible. A part of the, uh, the whole uh, mission statement of the Fear No Evil ministry is we want to confidently go out and talk about these things. And we want to prepare people to not be afraid of having a, um, a confident discussion about this. When a Malcolm Gladwell walks up to you and starts talking to you about what really happened in the Bible, unless he is using only the Bible to explain it, uh, you can stand up to what he says to you by yourself only using the Bible. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's something we need to get better at. We need to be confident when we, uh, when we hear arguments like this and when we see talks like this, it's okay for us to stand up and say, you know, hey, wait a minute, that's, that's not really, you know, what it is. One man's opinion is, is not a... Uh, turning on the head of the narrative. It's a, it's only his own opinion. And, you know, it's, um, instead of this being the unheard story of David and Goliath, it, it should have been, uh, you know, my previously unheard, unheard opinion of David and Goliath <laughs> that you are now hearing. And that's, you know, I, and I'm not trying to be mean to Malcolm Gladwell. I know he's written some books that have done a lot of good for some people that, you know, uh, that respect him as a philosopher and a psychologist and, and all of that. Um, it's just, this is, again, this is territory that he was not prepared to, um, to be an authority in. And it's, uh, um, it, and it really shows in his talk. So, you know, but yeah, we'll, like I said, we'll do more. We'll do another talk at some point about David and Goliath and we'll, you know, we'll expand on a lot of these concepts to, you know, um, to not just counterpoint what he said, but to actually just explore the narrative in itself, because really the David and Goliath narrative is, it's way more than just the confrontation. The, the confrontation is a small part of the chapter. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this talk, it's really about how to, you know, how to be a man. And, and I don't say that to remove the relevance from women, you know, um, but uh, but it's important for for young men to, to grow up knowing what they're responsible for. And the the full David and Goliath narrative uh, has so much to say about that. And it's really a wonderful story about the day in the life of a future king. And and it's it's something we should study more. And we will later, you know. But uh, but for now, you know the the focus was this, uh, you know, this misguided attempt at explaining something by somebody who wasn't an authority, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll kind of leave it at that. Yeah. So, you know, keep God in the Bible. Keep you know. <laughs> keep God in the Bible, <laughs> keep man. The faith. You know, and uh, especially when you know, again, you know, like if you wanted to discuss David, at least quote him. Sure. <laughs> yeah, at least quote him because that changes everything, you know. And uh, David knew why he was going to win, and you know it would it would be funny to see David, you know, to have Gladwell approach David, you know, and he's like, "Hey, man, why don't you take more credit for what you did?" And <sighs> David says, uh, "I gave credit where credit was due." Sure. And that's that's the end of it. So. 
Yep, that's it. Well, I mean, uh, again, I'm, I'm enlightened, and I, and I I have a better understanding of the story, man, so I appreciate that. Well, hey, man, that's awesome. I, uh, I appreciate you uh, being here for the talks, so let's pray. All right. Lord God, thank you for this time to come together and discuss uh, our history as a people and to uh, to correct some, some distorted um, viewpoints people have out, out there. Uh, help us all to always remember that uh, philosophy is not theology and philosophy cannot remove the significance of theology uh, where God has been God will always be and he cannot be removed from his own story uh, help us all to be confident in discussing um, his story with each other and being confident to to stand up for a uh, against the distortion of the narrative um, help us all to be confident as Christians in, in believing that that God is always there and that we don't have to be the hero of the story because any story that we're um, a hero is not as good as a, a story of the God who saves. And um, this was a, a great moment for us as a people where, where God stepped in and intervened and took care of his children. And let's always keep it, um, uh, keep that at the center of this story is that we have a God who loves us, who protects us, and who will win the, the, the fight for us so that we don't have to be afraid. And that's, uh, that's what we want to be as a, a people who are fearless, knowing we serve a God who who will always protect us and, and always keep us um, as his children. And, and that's important and that's who we are and that's who we always will be and that's who we wanna be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.